Saxon Chronicle version E. We all knew that, didn't we? Um, and, and it, it, but it just sort of makes you realise that if you become familiar with these things, you know, you can level, develop that kind of expertise. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is a couple of things. I'll start with this idea that, you know, how can we go with the extra mile with sources? The first one, I think, is, is you know, something that's come up a few times today, which is the teacher history, not the exam. Uh, obviously, we all know why there's a tendency to you know, play safe and, and teach question 4A or rather than actually the history that's in there. But you know, there's, there's a body of evidence now, uh, quite apart from the fact that teaching your subject is the right thing to do, that, that teaching to the test doesn't even work. You know, there isn't a lot of research about this, and there should be, but there isn't. Um, what there is, is mostly from the United States, and in the trust that I work with, um, we found this particular body of research quite useful in helping heads of history to combat sort of school or trust level initiatives, you know, sort of data drops and um, everybody doing the same exam style question uh, at certain points in time, at year seven, and all the stuff like that. And I don't know if you can make out the detail, but obviously the, the slides will be made available. But there are a couple of things here. That, that, so, for example, in the state of Illinois, so we, now we're talking somewhere that's probably about the size of England, um, <coughs> the, the, they found that intensive use of test strategies and item practice didn't actually improve student performance at all. When you go and read the paper, you start to find them suggesting that maybe it actually even made it worse. Yeah, and then the second bullet point here, the, another study in Illinois showed that what they call authentic learning, students exposed to more authentic intellectual work saw greater gains on tests. Yeah, I, I, it's not that surprising, is it? If you turn kids into historians, they get good at history. You know, that, that's really what we're, we're looking at. Um, and so, you know, take, taking that as my line, um, I'm thinking that, okay, so, so what is it that makes a historian good at history as far as using sources is concerned? And I've tried to break this down into, into a few elements. <coughs> the first thing I think is, can we, I'm arguing that we can, use a bit of time, not huge amounts of time, to just make kids more aware about sources, what they are, where they come from, how they get used, what, what they do. And these, I think, are just little telling points. I'll, I'll, you know, well, I'll show you what I've got in mind in a minute. I think we also need to rethink the useful question. You know, it's there in all kinds of different forms and different exams, and ultimately, you know, it can just tie us in knots. You know, at best, you know, sometimes we're just seeing a like dog's breakfast, aren't we? So, you know, can we actually just sort of turn this around and start thinking like historians would about the useful question? And so, as you can see, I'm going to break that down into a couple of third stages. And then finally, this idea of, you know, having looked at sources at the single level, can we replicate that across collections of sources? Because again, that's more or less what Paul Morris was talking about, wasn't it, earlier on? 
the, the big difference between him and the authors that he was so spectacularly pillorying um, in all good faith, whereas the, the authors that he was really having a pop at are essentially people who have preconceived ideas and are cherry-picking those sources in order to prop up those preconceived ideas, or indeed maybe for commercial purposes, whatever. Keeping you on your toes today, aren't I, Scott? Just uh, a bit there. Two, two to the left, <laughs> two to the right. Um, <coughs> I know, I have incredible biceps at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's look at the problem to start with. Um, best way to look is probably to get some sense of what kids think about sources. Um, so, you know, exam scripts, I think, are always a good place to look. And it's, it's surprising how often we get little messages like this. This is some of my favourites. So, um, <coughs> might as well lie and give me a C, smiley face. Okay? Two smiley faces, you get a B. Um, <coughs> or sometimes it's more direct. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know the bit about that that really hurt? Is it was my senior examiners who showed me that. <laughs> Sometimes it's a bit more detailed. I know some of you will have seen this one before. So this is a student in a real exam who basically gave up on it and said, in my opinion, I don't see how sources are testing students on their knowledge, on the history they've been studying, as if you don't get the message of the source, then you aren't going to be able to answer the question correctly. So in future, I think personally, it'd be better to be examined in a different way. Even if I did not know what there was to know on the subject, I still wouldn't get a good grade, as I don't get the source. It'd be simpler to just ask questions and answer them in full, just being tested like that. History's hard enough without having sources as well, as you have a lot to learn in such a short time. Please take what I have wrote in consideration. Many thanks, Michael Gold. <laughs> the name is Melanie, actually. And, and I do think this is very, very revealing, isn't it, of a mindset about, you know, basically the bottom line here is what the f are you putting these things in for? You know, what have these things got to do with me? Yeah, if I, why can't I just learn a load of stuff and write it out again? Yeah, that, that's her motivation, essentially. And, and, you know, we've got to try and somehow make a case that actually, sorry Melanie, but A, that's the wrong view, and, and B, you know, we're going to try and persuade you otherwise. So, can we do a little bit more to just make them more aware of, of sources? <coughs> One way would be to use straightforward photographs of archives. How many kids are ever going to go to an archive? You know, it's pretty unlikely, isn't it? And <coughs> when they do, they get to see where the historians get their history from. And maybe, just maybe, that provides a powerful visual entry point to the basic premise, which is that history is constructed that historians select things. You know, I always make the point of groups of students about the textbooks, that you know, they don't just go out in the garden and find them. Yeah? They don't just give birth to them. You just think of those sharp edges. So, <coughs> you, know, you have to put them together. You have to select things from somewhere else. That's what historians do. The famous Gustav Flaubert quote, that writing history is like drinking an ocean and peeing a cupful. Yeah, I actually have that as a slide I use in revision sessions. You know, the task is called peeing a cup. Yeah, that's, that's the point of the exercise. You can't do it all. You can't write it all. Sorry. That's how it goes. Another favourite is the knowledge wardrobe. Most kids tend to try to put on everything they own. Whereas actually what we want them to do is to put together the right outfit. Yeah. So just getting this idea that you know, if you overwhelm them, now I'm not going to play it because of the disasters we saw with BBC guys, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the National Archives has a couple of clips here, video clips, that show you where sources live and, what, and the life of a source from it being you know, inherited, created, whatever, and going into an archive. They're only about two minutes, something of that sort. 
but just a way of getting across this idea that the sources are you know, the bedrock of what historians do and that they can't use them all. They have to construct some kind of story from the sources that they have available. If you want to go a bit further, this one is quite nice because it just makes the point that <clears throat> when stuff comes in, yeah, somehow archivists have got to make some sort of decision about where they keep them, because otherwise they'll never find anything again. You know, can you imagine if Sainsbury's organised their stores around the idea that, well, that one came in a red van, yeah, that one came in a blue van, yeah, what if they changed the van? You know, somehow, I mean, it, to us, sometimes it might seem strange that I want to investigate history of slavery. Ah, okay, well, actually, you're going to find the records of the Admiralty quite useful. Yeah, it's not the obvious place to look, but when you stop and think about it, oh yeah, okay, I get that. Especially if you were talking about abolition, for example, and the attempt to stop the slave trade, that's where you would look. So, just getting across the idea of an archive, okay, and I think a quick, easy way are things like image libraries. Yeah, you get a sense. So if you just go to the British Library, Images Online, and put in pretty much anything, but it's probably a good idea to go with um, kind of medieval stuff. That's where their real strength is. Yeah. So if you put something like, I don't know, purgatory, something like that, you will get medieval representations of purgatory. Yeah. If you want to be really anarchy about it, it will also give you things like shelf marks and catalogue numbers and that sort of thing. You can just make the point that this is how, you know, imagine how many of these sources there are that historians have to look through. The National Archives has something similar. Or if you want to go a bit more mainstream, you know, just Getty Images is probably the biggest image library of the lot. Yeah? And... <coughs> checking for the satellites, it's miles better than Google Images. <laughs> yeah? The searches are relevant, better quality, and in many cases, they know who the photographer is. Now that is a powerful thing. Yeah? You think about it, for us as historians, a photograph, nine times out of ten, it's a photograph of something we already know. You know when you see Chamberlain waving the piece of paper, well, we know he did that. Is it really very useful? But actually knowing how it was presented to people, what caption did it have, which newspaper was it in? Yeah, and, and that's the sort of thing that collections like this do provide, but that Google Images won't. Google Images basically, nice image, log, link to a dodgy blog. Yeah, that's, that's usually how it works, isn't it? So, <coughs> If you want to go further still, I really, really recommend this little thread from September of last year with an American historian called Danielle McGuire. And she just got into a, kind of, a bit of a discussion with some people about the work of historians. And again, apologies if you can't read it all, but she basically says, historians are detectives. Nothing is ever put together for you. No story comes in whole cloth. You find threads, you pull them, and you see where they take you. Now, I just think this is a really powerful idea, that, because I think most kids think about what I call the gold mine model of history. You know, the history's out there somewhere, and the historian goes into the mines and, and digs around, and, oh, there's the history. Yeah, and, and it isn't like that. You know, if a historian starts talking about the causes of something, let's not forget, those causes, they don't exist in physical form. They are ideas. They are concepts. Yeah? There's no, there's no, you can't pick up a cause. You might be able to pick up something that is a cause of something, but you can't pick up the cause of it. Yeah? These, these are ideas, and you know, this is why it's difficult. And she talks a little bit further on. It's important for people to know about the real labour historians do to make the past come to life. The labour we do to make the past come to life. Later on, she says, 
its discovery work in the same way that archaeologists discover artifacts and make meaning out of them. I'm sorry, I missed a bit further up. To build connections where none were there before. Because that's what we do as historians, isn't it? Yeah? It's another really important thing to recognise that history is not events. History starts when the events have finished. And then we try and make sense of those events. What the hell just happened, basically, if you're Herodotus? Okay? And obviously then, from then on, we're looking back to a period of our choice. So, <clears throat> you could kind of sum it up a little bit like this. You know, for many kids, history is the stuff in the book. You know, the book is history, and history is the book. All I have to do is learn it all, and I'm sorted. I now know history. Yeah? Whereas, <clears throat> I think that this lovely diagram, which was scribbled by a, a basically a pissed off PhD student um, at some point, kind of really nails it. So this is the research carrot. Uh, <clears throat> and what she's saying is, you know, th these are the sources that have appeared in the secondary literature, and these are all the things that nobody's found. And there's another interesting metaphor there, isn't there? Because, you know, for, from many students' point of view, then the idea of a source that comes up with something that isn't in the book is a nightmare. Yeah? When you have novice levels of knowledge, novices we know tend to want to hang on to the knowledge they've got. As they become closer to a mastery level, they become more confident with the idea that they don't know everything. So new knowledge is threatening to a novice and actually quite exciting to a master. <coughs> Think about it. You know, a source comes along that seems to challenge the textbook view of the, of the world and a 14-year-old goes, ah! If the same thing happens to a historian, they start rubbing their hands and thinking, hmm, TV series. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so... It's also worth bearing in mind that sometimes the sources really do shape the history. Let's think about Eamon Duffy's work on the voices of Morbath. Yeah, that basically from 1530-something, the Reformation, the English Reformation, well, obviously it happened, but in my view, more interestingly, it then became packaged. Catholic Church, corrupt, useless, everybody wanted the Reformation, hooray! And look, now we're all brilliant. Okay. And that story, that narrative, propelled by people like uh, Jeffrey Dickens, for example, that was incredibly powerful, and driving the very sort of stuff that, in Freeman, that Mark Morris was talking about earlier on, the wonderfulness of us, that Whig interpretation of history, generated in the late 19th century, well, we are top nation, so therefore we must have top history. Yeah, the Victorians still shape the way we view our own history. I think it's really important to recognise that. However, <coughs> as I say, Aidan Duffy comes along and starts saying, yeah, okay, fine, I, li I like this narrative. I'm now going to look and see what people actually did. I'm going to read the accounts of the church warden of Morbath. And, of course, surprise, surprise, what he discovered is that people weren't that keen on the Reformation. People don't like change, do they? Yeah? Especially when it's being brought in by preachy people. <laughs> you know, <coughs> the kind of people you don't get here. Um, <coughs> so, you know, by going to some sources, you know, it changed it round. Appeasement. Basically, the orthodox view of appeasement, as set out by Churchill, was the standard view. What changed that was the Public Records Office, of, sorry, Public Records Act of 1957, which brought in the famous 30-year rule. 
Okay? You might not be aware of this, but basically Churchill did a backstairs deal with Attlee to, to access all of the records. So he was the only one who had access to any of the records of the appeasement period, and his interpretation became the standard one until Bingo, 1968, all of the records start coming out and being made available. And surprise, surprise, we get revisionist views. There's a shock. Yeah. So, you know, the, the very, very access to this stuff. Soviet sources changed our views on various things after they became available at the end of the Cold War. Anthony Beaver always tells this story about how um, he, he just kept finding things in, in Soviet archives. As soon as he found them, they took them away again. But, um, you know, his, his history of Stalingrad particularly was based heavily on that. And of course now, the online access to archives means that you know, to, the, a huge range of material is much more available to a much wider range of scholars. Yeah? So I'm not suggesting we develop whole terms to this or anything like that, but I do think these are points that can just crop up in an exam. Sorry, in a lesson, the Freudian slip. Uh, you know, and, and in the process, I think they help us to understand and to some extent demystify sources. Also worth looking at the idea that a lot of history, again Mark Morris was referring to this really, is that you know, there is no manual for the Norman Conquest. There's no manual for most history. If you want to study medieval immigration, for example, there are no medieval immigration records. There's no textbook saying, here's the story of medieval immigration. So what this project team did was to go to the tax office. Because it just so happened that from 1330 to 1550, the government basically had what they call an alien subsidy, which was a tax on foreigners. Yeah? Now obviously what the government was interested in was the money, but what's been left behind by historians is lists of foreigners. Yeah? And the conclusion they came to, that even in the medieval period, you were never more than 10 miles away from an immigrant. Yeah, it's, it's really quite surprising how much you see there. Again, we talked about, <coughs> um, you know, where, where would you look, okay, we know what Churchill thinks about appeasement, we know what generally is brought to the appeasement. Where, where would you look to see what ordinary people thought of appeasement? I guess you could look at the press. But how ordinary people is that? Yeah? But what you have got in bodies like the Churchill Archive is all of Churchill's correspondence. And what we have is all of the letters that were written to Churchill by ordinary people about appeasement. Yeah? And it's not the most obvious place to look at in the first place, but that's what <laughs> historians do. Yeah? They, they have to discover the past, if you like, by looking in strange places. Okay, so to round up this bit, you know, it's, it's to try and rehabilitate sources, if you like, you know, to make them less terrifying, to make them less mystifying. Yeah. Melanie doesn't want to hear this stuff, but she's not going to get any better unless she gets her head around it. Yeah. The sources are not just unhelpful versions of the textbook. Yeah? If you want to put it crudely, one of my favourite mantras was always that you know, textbooks good for telling you what happened. Sources are good for telling you how people felt about what happened. Yeah? Now that doesn't cover it all, but you know, it, it's quite a useful way of making a distinction between the two as a starter. And let's think about all the things that they can bring up. Attitudes particularly, concerns, prejudices, values. These are all the things that textbooks aren't particularly good at. And we can also consider just the fact that something exists. I'll come on to that in a minute. So, <coughs> hopefully, if we can get our kids to see that these sources, you know, whatever source we put in front of them is going to be selected from a vast collection. What are we going to do with them? I think the first thing we can do is to stop doing things that historians don't do. 
You might have noticed you know, when Mark Morris was talking earlier on, if you had, you know, several of you have a copy of his book, if you look in the back, you're not going to see a section that says, here are the sources I didn't use. If the source isn't useful, you don't use it. Probably because it's not about the thing that you're studying. And I think this is where we've you know, gone a little bit off track. We're looking for this general theory of sources, some manner of making use of everything. Oh, and being aware of its limitations as well. I, I just think it's impossible. Okay. So, Walsh's general theory of sources says there is no general theory of sources. Sorry, you're just going to have to engage with the sources as they come at you. All sources are useful for something. Yeah? And if your exam board keeps putting something on the end of a question that limits your ability to say something about it, then have a go at them. They are all useful. Get over it. Okay? We know how much they love limitations. Okay? And, you know, as a Catholic, I love taking away things that make people happy. Okay? So, <laughs> let's stop trying to make the sources work so hard. Mark Morris doesn't try and get the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle version in to tell him something that it doesn't say. He also doesn't waste his time with what it doesn't tell him. You know, let's put that old chestnut about what it doesn't tell you. Well, you know, that means the answer to everything is, it's not the Bible. <laughs> this source on women's suffrage isn't useful because it doesn't tell me anything about the Cold War. <laughs> you know, it's the same basic principle, isn't it? Now, you know, I know that we try and do this sort of thing. This is from one of the teachers in my, my trust, you know, saying, Try and cover all of these. My advice is, don't try and cover all of these. Because you can never find a formula that will fit every source. They're just too diverse. Harry. That's, I recognise that. I get tired just watching your website. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, the, the productivity is just incredible. This is, this is the closest I've seen to a universal theory of sources. Okay? But I'm afraid, I mean, I still think that, for example, when you talked about photographs here, you know, you say as a limitation it can be used as propaganda. Well, I think that's quite useful. You know? And I think, you know, the other thing here is that, what do we mean by photographs? Those two are both photographs. But they're such incredibly different things. So one is a reconnaissance, aerial reconnaissance photograph, and the other one is a Remembrance Day photograph of the Cenotaph. They're just different sources that happen to be on photographic paper. Yeah, I just don't think, you know, sources, sorry, photographs and sources indeed are just going to be so different from each other, I just don't think we can come up with a coverall rule. I think we're better off just practicing. And that means scaling back what we want to try and get out of them. Historians don't ask whether a source is useful. They ask what it's useful for. So here, for example, <coughs> this is a, an account of the Viking attack on Holy Island from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. In this year, dire forewarnings came over the land of the Northumbrians and miserably terrified the people. These were extraordinary whirlwinds and lightnings and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. Obviously watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know, it would be so easy to dismiss this as a flight of fancy, wouldn't it? Oh, right, dragons. How can we rely on anything that talks about dragons? Okay, maybe we can't rely on it. The fact that it's not reliable doesn't mean that it isn't useful. Clearly, it's not reliable evidence of dragons. I do think it's rather good evidence that something has seriously spooked Northumbria. 
This is evidence of the impact of Viking raids. It's biased as hell and it's total nonsense. But it's still a very useful source. If we can look for where the usefulness is. So let's look at what they actually do. Sorry, this hasn't really come out very well, but my point is that, you know, what we could do here is actually just look at a few bits of historians where they use some sources. So in this particular instance, uh, if you haven't seen Fiona Reed's book, and it's absolutely fabulous on uh, medicine on the Western Front particularly, um, <clears throat> As she talks about, in the summer of 1915, many different men in the Welsh regiments on the Western Front reported overhearing the following conversation. Die. Which would you rather be killed in? A railway accident or an explosion? Die, munched on for so long, blah, blah, blah. But bottom line, he says that I'd rather be killed in a railway accident because my body would be vaguely intact. If I was blown up, then nobody would know that I'd even existed. That was his, his bottom line. And she says, this tale, probably apocryphal, reveals one of the soldier's greatest fears, that of being torn apart or literally blown to pieces. Making a point, using a source. Yeah. And she's even making the point that the source itself might be apocryphal, but people reported hearing it, which makes it a source. So, Let's look at, you know, if we want to find our line as to how we want our kids to use sources, let's look at the way our historians use sources. James, I'm not sure, are you here? I thought he might be. Um, <coughs> I had a quick exchange with Joe, James about this, where he was talking about how he'd been using the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle with his Year 7s. And we, we just got chatting about it because he, he was basically sort of, you know, getting them into it and getting them reading it. It was primarily a literacy thing. But we then talked about how it might be quite interesting, might it, to then read a bit of Mark Morris and ask the question, did Mark Morris find the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle useful? So in other words, you, you trawl through a bit of Morris and then you sort of say, oh look, he's been here. Yeah, you can find Mark Morris's footprints or Simon Sharma's footprints all over these sorts of things. And of course, you know, that goes for any bit of history, any kind of history where we just look at not what the historian says in this particular instance, but what sources did he use, how did he use them, or how did she use them. Absolute masterclass in this is the wonderful um, book by Susanna Lipscomb on Henry VIII's will. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's absolutely fabulous, isn't it? I mean, she, you can just hear her squealing on each page, can't you? Oh, look at this. Yeah. She just works her way through Henry VIII's will and points out all the different ways it tells you stuff that it didn't originally intend to. Yeah. All the inferences that you can make from it. Obviously, you know, she picks up on what it does say, but she particularly looks at it that way. Now, checklists came up earlier. Thank you. No, I'll work these on. Um, so, obviously we can't go through all of this, but what I'm saying is that you can't go far wrong, even in an exam, by making a valid inference about how or why the source is going to be useful. And my advice to most of the students I work with is, that's it, get out. Just don't, don't even bother with limitations. First of all, it's not historical. And secondly, this will get you most of the marks. Just think about how it is useful. Be positive. And this is just a way of thinking, you know, all the different things that it could be used as evidence of or evidence for. Now, you know, you're not going to expect them to learn that list. You know, the idea is that we, we use this from year seven. We have it stuck in the front of the book. And you get them saying, you know, well, let's look at a couple of sources here. How many of these things could apply to this source that we're actually looking at? And that way, they just become users of sources. Yeah? <clears throat> All the studies on memory, for example, show very clearly that technique is actually much less powerful than memory. So, for example, if you take chess players, for a good instance, when, when a chess player, a, a top-level chess player, 
makes a move on the chessboard, okay, it's about 5% strategic thinking, and it's about 95% the kids to be good at sources is to give them that database of having used them lots and lots, time and time again. This is another type of collection, or oh, sorry, of ways of using it. <coughs> Can we find examples of somebody doing any of these things? So, if we're looking then at the, you know, at that level, then you know we start to think to ourselves, let's just forget them. Why would you think about the limitations of two sources like this? Because you're just going down a rabbit hole. The fact is that that source on the left, yeah, it's an official photograph. Get over it. Yeah, it shows us the nuts and bolts of the dressing station. You could even go crazy and infer that because it's an official photograph, maybe they're proud of it. There's a hell of a lot of these photographs in the Imperial War Museum, it has to be said, an absolute staggering number of them. Now, most kids will be tempted to go down the line of, this is more useful than this one, because this one's just a painting. Look at the pain. Look at the suffering. Look at the stress and misery. It's this Catholic thing coming in again. <laughs> in, on that second one. And how can we just escape the conclusion that one of them's useful for one thing and the other one's quite useful for something else? Why do we need more than that? Why are our exam questions not saying, how are these two sources useful? about treatment. Let the kids figure out what they're useful for. If I just make a point, obviously our questions do say that. But, uh, <coughs> okay, so you know, my point is, you know, if we, once we start getting to limitations, we're just going down into some sort of rabbit hole, mad spiral. You know, that, oh, well, that might have had a headache that day. He clearly has, hasn't he? But, you know, the emotion, the, the feeling, the rawness is what that painting gives us. The nuts and bolts is what that one gives us. Who's, who's to say one's more useful than the other? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Booth map. Does it tell us more about London or does it tell us more about Booth? Yeah? That's another really, really good way. Now, if your kids are getting a bit stuck with sources, sources will always reveal something about the person who's created them. Yeah, it is terribly useful about all the stuff, you know, the conditions and poverty, blah, 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 but it also shows us that Booth is very worried about something. And he's not alone. Why else would you do this? You're not going to do it for a hobby, are you? <clears throat> Why are they showing pictures of a bathhouse? I don't think it's the first time Australians have ever been clean. Yeah. So, so why, why, why are we so anxious to show Australians in a bathhouse? Because they're building bathhouses, aren't they? Because they're concerned about the spread of disease. Bathing was compulsory. Yeah. So don't give me any crap about it being an official photograph, so it might be posed. Of course it's bloody posed. They want people to know what they're doing. And they're proud of it. I'll move on to a couple more. Uh, <clears throat> this one was, those are the sectors of the Western Front. Can you see the small numbers in blue? Yeah, have a guess. Not exactly, sort of casual, it's actually bodies. So, this is when they start giving um, dog tags out. Yeah, so you're probably aware that everybody had two dog tags. Yeah, so if you found somebody with two, if you have a body with two dog tags, you took one and you left the other one with it. Yeah, um, and really quite early on, 1915, they're thinking about this. What are we going to do about all the bodies? Uh, and it's no coincidence that you know the British memorialisation and 
burials is is you know so very well advanced. Okay, <coughs> a couple more. This is a painting from 1938 by the British artist Charles Bensway. Sorry, it's probably a bit dark. Uh, British war veteran, First World War veteran. Maybe you can make out the gas mask. Newspaper there, picture of Chamberlain. You know, clearly unhappy about the prospect of war, about, you know, well, presumably supporting opinions or whatever. It's one type of useful. It's a type of protest. It tells you about the artist. That's a different type of useful. That advertisement is for that painting. You know, when we've got just the painting, it tells us a certain amount. But this tells us a different story. It tells us that large numbers of people want to buy that painting. And what can we infer from the fact that they want to buy that painting? Especially when you look at the date. March 1940, and people are wanting to buy an anti-war painting. Okay, we haven't got time to go into the detail of that, but it's pretty fascinating stuff. So, <coughs> if you want to take it a bit further, you know, my, my view on this is it's useful. Get over it. It's useful because it might provide us with some information. That's great. That's the kind of basic level. It's useful because we can make some sort of inference from it. We can, we can get it to tell us something that it doesn't spell out in words of one syllable. And we can maybe even find it useful because of the fact that it exists. <coughs> and if I explain that one, this is my actual favourite source. 1906, Introduction of School Meals. And the inspectorate in Bradford decided to measure the impact of school meal by weighing the kids every week. And what this line shows is what happens to the weight of the kids. This is where it, it's introduced. This is where school meal <coughs> came in. Look what happens in the holidays. You know, so what it says is the kids' weight goes up and down. Well done. What it tells us is about poverty, isn't it? The inference that we can make from this is that God lives are hard. Because otherwise, why would their weight drop during the holidays? Does that remember that third thing? Is it not also interesting? for the fact that the inspectors did this. Doesn't that tell us something about their motives and maybe <coughs> even the wider debate about poverty, that something had to be done? I'm gonna <coughs> skip on a few. Because I think we can also use sources to get into mindsets. It's so easy, isn't it, to dismiss the medieval period as a bunch of mad people covered in poo. Okay? But actually, you can see here that essentially this, this is a, a really, really good explanation of how they think purgatory works. Yeah? So there's heaven, there's hell, or purgatory. You pray, and you do good works, and that allows the, the priest to haul you up out of purgatory into heaven. And I think it's really important this, you know, this I think raised a really interesting distinction of the difference between an image and a visual source. Yeah, important to make that distinction sometimes, well, most of the time I think. It's not just an image, you know, clearly it's not real, but it is an evidence of what people believe. There's also this idea of whose picture are you getting? You know, if I say to you, picture the you know the typical female munition worker of the First World War, then I think these sorts of images come to mind. 
except that these are not images created by female munition workers. This is an image created by a female munition worker. And it's quite interesting to see the difference between there's a bit less swooning and being patriotic and a bit more spending shed loads of cash on hats. Yeah? That's their view. They're entitled to it. It's not their fault that we've got a view of munition workers that's been given to us by somebody else. And speaking of which... The guns in France are booming. So are the sales of Look No Source. Really? The great push at Chelton's begins on Friday, July the 7th. The big push, some rare bargains. <coughs> the battle against high prices is won. There's some sale going on at Chelton's. Great slaughter of prices in all departments. Oh my God. Now we've got two choices here. Either these people are just batshit mental, <laughs> or they don't think of these things in the same way. You know, we, we have developed an interpretation over time, and people at that time saw maybe new things or didn't know things. Yeah? But we've just got to accept that people are not weird because they don't think like we do. Here's a life lesson. <laughs> <coughs> I just threw that in because I knew you'd like it. So this is from 1972. <laughs> Driving? Don't have that fifth pint. <laughs> you know who I'm talking to. Okay. <coughs> so, finally, just to kind of round up, you know, we've been looking at different ways of looking at individual sources. But again, as I mentioned at the start, you know, historians tend to work with source collections rather than sources themselves. And so I think that we can do several interesting things. <coughs> so a favorite of mine, for example, is to predict the past. Yeah? So I used to just take uh, a section of the textbook, photocopy it, cut the sources out, shove them in an envelope. Do you know why it's so important that it goes in an envelope? No, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It makes all the difference. It's obviously some sort of Christmas thing going on. Um, and ask the kids to just say, you know, so obviously it works best if this is a really unfamiliar, something they've no idea about. And you just say to them, what do you think is going on in this period? <laughs> What are the main things that interest, worry people, whatever? You know, use your checklist in that way. And then, of course, you can send them to the textbook and say, were you right? Is, is your guess right about what's going on? You know, you're in the position of historians now where you haven't got the full picture. And you actually have to try and figure out what's going on. I think we could also do a lot. I, I mean, I'm assuming all of this stuff's going on on a folder somewhere. So I've, I've put in a folder um, some mini collections um, and this one particularly, one that I, I really like, uh, <coughs> is, is whether people at the time knew what was going on in the trenches. Yeah, I think you'll find it interesting if, if you're sort of teaching that sort of period. I mean, if, <laughs> spoiler alert, they did. Um, <coughs> particularly because the national press, on the whole, was censored. The local press wasn't. Yeah. And local press was much, much more significant a feature of life than, than it is today. We've also got a source-based investigation about Peterloo. So, in keeping with the theme here. But I'm going to sort of rattle through this uh, in order to finish on time. Um, <coughs> another way that we can use sources, again, keeping with the, the, the theme that, that Jackie sort of brought up, was this idea of plausible reconstruction. 
Okay, so could we, Michael, could we hit that link, the a trench scene? Just as well as the video, I said. So, <coughs> not not to worry anyway. The the bottom line here is that we, we give the students sort of you know half a dozen sources from soldiers who were there in the trenches and re recording their experiences, and then ah oh, here we go. And if you could so if you could just scroll down, yeah. So we get them to look at all of these sources up here, and then we say to them right. Sorry, you can go to the picture now. Uh, <coughs> this is the opening scene of a film set in the trenches. Okay. What's that bloke going to say? Now, you know, obviously this depends on which groups you're using this with. You know, if you've got a sort of demonic year nine on a Friday afternoon, then either you maybe give it a miss or you just say, right, okay, I mean, what I always used to do is say, Let's get it out of the way. Shit, bum, willy, poo, wang. Let's just put it all down. <laughs> so, get, get in there. Now can we start? But, but the point was that whatever they say here, you know, you then come back to them and say, well, wh why do you think he's saying that? Just prove it. Go back to the sources and tell me where you got that from. And that's that difference. You know, we've had this thing, haven't we, about English and, and history, and I completely really do go along with this idea of you know, the similarities between us. But one of the things they do is imagine it's a reconstruction. We don't. You know, for us, it's plausible reconstruction. Yes, it's reconstruction, but I think, is it reasonable to say, I can't find my nuclear weapons? No, it's not. Is it reasonable to say, where are my cigarettes? I think it is reasonable to say that. We've got evidence that shows that that's the kind of thing that he, that he might be looking at. Okay, just going to come out to the back to the... And so, finally, um, <coughs> take a collection of sources, you know, is your source important enough to go in a museum or an art gallery? And, Michael, could you hit that link again? I think it might just open the folder, actually. Um, it's probably lurking behind here. Or just gone blank. <laughs> now, let's just go, go back to the, the presentation. The, the long and short, <coughs> I've given you, again, a folder in there with two different templates for PowerPoint templates, basically, for creating a virtual art gallery or, or museum. So one of it is uh, from an American educator, and the, the other one is from the Imperial War Museum. So Imperial War Museum have been really busy recently trying to you know, get people using their, their sort of collections. And then finally, something that is one of those you know, ideas off the top of the head that, that turned into a reality was, you know, what do we mean by the value of the tools? And in this instance, we, we got the kids to consider a bunch of sources relating to the suffragettes and sort of said, how would you try and flog these on eBay? Because if you go onto eBay and type in suffragettes, there's loads. And what's quite interesting is, you know, why, why is that one more expensive than that one? What, what's, what's the thinking here? And of course, there is a wider, more important point, which I think kind of ties into what Mark Morris was talking about earlier, which is that on eBay, the big, spectacular, colourful, suffragette images are the ones that are valued. With the possible exception of the Emily Davidson Wilding, sorry, Emily Wilding Davidson one. Had an interesting discussion about that, because you know, some of the kids were saying, well, if you had the original, it would be worth a fortune, but you know, what about copy? Yeah. But the key point here is, eBay shows us that the spectacular uh, is of interest and generates interest and attention, much like Mark's three pastiche histories. But actually, from a historian's point of view, is that reflective? Is that reflective? No. There are no suffragist 
sources here. I couldn't find anything to do with suffragists on eBay. Yeah, and that I think is a telling story about the way in which particular types of history gets pa get packaged. And of course, I think it also tells us something about the way that the sources lend themselves to kind of popularisation and you know packaging in that sort of way. I think I'm just about on time, so I will just say thank you for your attention and to everybody, the organisers here as well. Thank you very much.